couple years ago, uh, I went to one of your lectures about hyperlipidemia. And uh, I treated hyperlipidemia as some sort of observation of mine, not as a disease. And that day, when I left that room, I knew that it was a disease. And uh, why don't you elaborate a little bit on that for... Uh, well, I think, you know, you make a very poignant point here, is that it's an observation. It's a spurious thing that happens and we don't do much with it. And uh, interestingly, the miniature schnauzer really surfaced as the pivotal point dog in this whole hyperlipidemia thing. Poster child. Yeah, you've seen a few of those, oh, yes. I suspect. But in the United States, there appears to be not only a large number of miniature schnauzers, but other breeds and mixed breed dogs that have a propensity not to handle dietary fat well. This is different than human lipid disease, right. which is predominantly genetically based, it is predominantly cholesterol based, and it is predominantly heart risk. That's the issue. In the dog, it is number one, a triglyceride disease, not cholesterol. Right. And the point that I made, in fact, today at, at uh, the presentation on that is a very important point. I think any veterinarian that observes a dog that has fasted for, let's say, six to eight hours even, and has visible lipid in the serum portion of the blood, that dog has a problem. There is something wrong. In the context of abnormality, that is one. We have seen these dogs, and I'm sure you would agree, that are perhaps 36 hours fasted and have serum that is so lipemic you can't see through it. And that dog is at risk for other secondary complications. The point I'm making to veterinarians is you can improve the quality of life in that dog, number one. Number two, you should pursue that as a clinical problem. It is something that we can treat very effectively in 90% of the cases with a very good outcome with diet. Well, I remember one of the things we talked about in that room that day was, in essence, uh, some of these schnauzers, they get to be 11 years of age that have never, ever had a seizure before. And and they're, and and they're sometimes we're documenting some of these, you know, we have blood work when they were seven or nine, and now, right. and now the triglycerides are way up. Dog starts to have well, seizures I'm, from time to time. I'm impressed you remember all that stuff. Um, you're right. I am a little embarrassed and a little chagrined by the fact that we haven't made a bigger issue out of the relationship between hyperlipidemia and seizure disorder in the dog. It pops up on a table once in a while in a textbook, but the fact is we've accumulated quite a bit of, of quite a number of cases of dogs, not just schnauzers, but dogs that had late onset life seizures. And you know, that rings bells of tumor. Right. It's the young dog that has idiopathic epilepsy. The older dog, we're thinking something serious going on. Well, you're changing their threshold. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And and that dog is also the dog. And I've and I've had these clients come in before, and they're it's like, uh, well, listen, I know his triglycerides are 680 or something. We just fed him one piece of bacon, and I'm like, okay, Pinocchio. There's there's more to it than this. You do not feed a dog one piece of bacon and That's get right. a triglycerides to 680. And, and I feel bad about it now because I think they were there because the dog had pancreatitis or right, something like exactly. that, that the hyperlipidemia had triggered pancreatitis. And, and here I was. Uh, and I felt that was the one thing about the lecture I felt bad about afterwards because I'd given, I'd given a few people a rough time about, hey, listen, I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with telling me the truth. And probably they were telling me the truth. This dog was just on the cusp of having pancreatitis all the time. And all it took was one piece of bacon, albeit the fattest one that they, the fattest piece of bacon they had on the table, and they gave it to that dog. And of course, the dog only weighed 20 pounds, and that was enough to flip him and cause pain. What did they say? One potato chip for a chihuahua is like you and me eating two right. bags of large bags right. of potato chips. And I like the, the point you make about the, uh, the piece of bacon. You know, it's interesting. You, as you point out, you can give a piece of bacon. You, I've actually taken cat food, high fat, and added oil to it, mm -hmm. triglyceride, corn oil, and tried to make them fat or hyperlipemic, and I couldn't do it. Oh, they can get rid of it They fast. get rid of it quickly. Yeah. But if those patients were talking about the hyperlipidemic state dogs, they can't clear it. 
They have an inability, which apparently is genetically determined, to clear dietary lipid. So with that one piece of bacon and the potato chip they had before right. that and the other stuff before that, it's accumulating. And they can have, I'll, t I'll tell you, the highest level of triglycerides that I've personally experienced in a dog was 13,000 milligrams. Wow. Now, most labs, 100 to 150 milligrams is the high end of the triglyceride. Now. But we're going... Thousand. This dog had blood so thick it would hardly circulate. I'm really kind of surprised that some of the dog food companies don't play harder on it. I mean, it's a legitimate disease. It's a life. It's something that needs yeah. lifelong treatment with low fat. I mean, we can't feed them celery, but they have some of these foods that are eight and nine percent fat. And if you just put them on that, the clients come back and tell you, you know, wow, I'm kind of amazed. I just thought he was getting old. Yep. You know, exactly. he, he feels a lot better. Yeah. Exactly. Right.